The Ambassador Bridge between Detroit and Windsor, Ontario is one of the busiest border crossings in the country. Canadian Border Services has just been given a large infusion of funding to target a rapidly increasing problem, gun smuggling. Across the country last year, they seized 751 illegal guns, but they know that many more are getting through and contributing to gun violence. Superintendent Jason Crowley of the Windsor Police says gun trafficking is driven by the lucrative market in Canada for unlicensed firearms. You will see a gun, a firearm uh, purchased in the States for potentially, I don't know, $200, $300, and they'll go in the streets for $3,000, $3,500. So very lucrative for the people that are involved in these kind of uh, activities. They hide them. They hide them in uh, cars, in, in uh, panels in their cars, uh, maybe on them, uh, all kinds of, uh, they're ingenious, uh, to be honest, uh, the way they've, they've come up with hiding. If stopping guns at busy border crossings is tough, imagine the challenge in remote areas like the Quebec-Vermont border. Here, the frontier is often marked with a pylon in the middle of a field and a slash cut through the woods that goes for miles and miles. There's an issue here, so then we started uh, increasing how many agents we had. U.S. Border Agent Bradley Curtis brought us to a remote spot where you can see how easy it is to sneak across. So this is the border right here. Pretty much everything on this side, this is the United States. Once you cross this uh, old fence, everything on this side, that's up in Canada. I'm kind of surprised. What is border security along the Vermont Quebec border? Are there motion detectors? What is it that's along the border to protect the border at this point? We do have uh, sensors. Uh, we do have camera. We have technology that helps us monitor the border area. One of the most remarkable gun trafficking plots in these parts began between the neighboring towns of Derby Line, Vermont, and Stansted, Quebec, which share many facilities, including the famous Haskell Free Library that actually straddles the borderline. By tradition, Canadians are allowed to cross over to the U.S. side to enter the library without clearing customs. And if you go in there, you can see this line that separates the two countries, uh, separates the opera house upstairs. Uh, there's books on the Canadian side. They get checked out on the American side. So very unique situation. Is it a tricky thing for border services to handle? It is, yes. There's a lot of uh, these strange anomalies across the northern border. This happens to be one of them that we have to uh, work around, work with. In 2011, 34-year-old career criminal Alex Blackos from Montreal came up with a clever plan to take advantage of the unique library. What he was doing was basically he ended up uh, recruiting these uh, co-conspirators. And what they did is they were uh, taking money, his money, and going down to Florida uh, to buy weapons down in the Tampa area. He had arranged to rendezvous at the library with his co-conspirators. The accomplices, a man and a woman, entered the library from the U.S. side without having to clear customs. The man went to the washroom and deposited a backpack containing 10 handguns in the wastebasket there. Mr. Vlakos entered the library from the Canadian side and retrieved the gun bag from the washroom. Vlakos and his accomplices both left the library going in separate directions without raising the suspicion of the U.S. Border Patrol parked nearby. A few weeks later, Vlakos repeated the trick with 10 more guns in a backpack. This time, the Border Patrol became suspicious and stopped the American accomplices as they departed the library. Something's not right here. Uh, you're, uh, you're from Florida, you're in a rental car. Why are you... Why you have to ask a library? That information was, was documented, and basically uh, that was kind of one of our building blocks going forward uh, that helped the overall investigation. The gun smugglers had to come up with a new plan. This time they focused on a remote area 30 kilometers east of Stansted at a place called Wallace Pond. Alexis Vlakos had his American girlfriend drop him off near the border, where he hoped to cross undetected into the United States. With his criminal history and the fact that he's a Canadian citizen, he was basically uh, not allowed to make a legal entry to the United States. So the only way to, for him to get into the United States was to uh, illegally enter. His girlfriend cleared customs, then picked him up on the U.S. side. 
The couple drove off to her hometown of Tampa, Florida to buy more guns. This was to be their big score. Vlacos had his friends legally buy 34 handguns in Tampa. Days later, he was able to cross the border at the same spot carrying the guns. He said he did his best to follow the water's edge, but he got lost. He eventually made it to Canada. His girlfriend picked him up and they both traveled on to Montreal. His border crossings into and out of the United States went completely undetected. Uh, I've been with the United States Border Patrol for almost 25 years. We have 295 miles of border. Uh, we have over, just over 300 agents that are on the road. We can always use more personnel. We can always use more technology. We, we do a pretty good job detecting it. We're not really at all places at all times. Montreal police later found some of Lacos's guns during drug raids. And U.S. authorities were able to trace them, first to his American girlfriend and then to him. He pled guilty in the U.S. for illegally trafficking 104 firearms and served almost two years in a Montreal jail. His Canadian lawyer, Eric Sutton, is not surprised by how easy it was to sneak across the border. If that's really what you want to do, um, I think there are multiple opportunities geographically to take advantage of this border. And there is some surveillance, um, but they can't possibly control every, every uh, linear inch of this border. It's impossible. It's inconceivable. You know, they're talking about a handgun ban in Canada now, an assault weapons ban. What do you think that would do to the situation of, of, of the border? You know, uh, hard to say, but uh, um, human behavior would lead that, you know, would, would lead someone to uh, conclude that if it's easier and cheaper to get it somewhere else, they might go that route. There's money to be made. Yes, sir. They're going to try to get it across the border. Yes, sir. Back on the Windsor-Detroit border, police came across an even more devious gun trafficking scheme. Dreamed up, they say, by small-time Canadian gangster Lamar Porter. He would buy guns in the U.S. and hide them in gun socks along with a GPS tracking device. He would cruise the parking lots of Detroit shopping malls looking for cars of Canadian cross-border shoppers and hide the guns inside their bumpers. The cross-border shoppers would then return to Canada along the Ambassador Bridge completely unaware of the guns they were transporting. Guided by the tracking device, Porter would then go to their Windsor homes and retrieve the guns in the middle of the night. Eventually, police discovered the gun smuggling route through wiretaps of Toronto gangsters who were buying the guns. They followed the gangsters to this Windsor club where Porter was photographed conducting his gun sale transactions. They were all arrested. Generally, how do smugglers get caught? I think intelligence is a big part of it. Um, you know, people talking, right? Uh, that's part of it. Uh, you know, disgruntled uh, partners, friends, criminals, mm -hmm. um, that so kind of thing. Somebody gets caught and rats out their partners. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's no honor among thieves, they say, right? Gun traffickers frequently try to grind off the serial numbers from weapons to prevent tracing but police are often able to detect the numbers anyway. Like this is on the polymer part of the, the firearm, so they could sand it, they could grind it, but a lot of these guns, are they're, they're ingrained in the body of the gun, in the, in the integrity of the gun. Uh, that's, where they're, that's where they're recovered. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there, so. These are all semi-automatic firearms. They all fire as fast as you can pull the trigger, they all fire. While police find new ways to trace guns, Criminals are coming up with new ways to obtain weapons like this. Hell yeah. Edmonton police recently found handguns being illegally converted into fully automatic machine pistols, some of which can fire over 30 bullets in two seconds. Ontario police found small-scale manufacturers assembling guns from easily obtainable parts weapons that would be totally untraceable. To be able to find this group that's manufacturing and distributing is, is actually quite unique and is, is a big deal. Near Arroyo, Ontario, 
Gun store owner Wes Winkle says that key parts of weapons can now be made with 3D printers. Yeah, if you have a, a polymer injection machine or a 3D printer uh, nowadays, this type of a component is not a hard thing to manufacture. You can produce them at high volumes for a relatively little cost. And when they're manufactured, they, there's no uh, tracing or no uh, numbers put on them at all. And therefore, we get the term ghost guns or, or what are being assembled as uh, a criminal element firearms. Mm -hmm. You know, they used to say, say that every gun told a story. Not so much anymore. Not so much anymore. And, and, uh, Another method uh, of gun trafficking in Toronto involves what is called straw buying. One university student with a gun license bought 22 weapons in 16 weeks, most from the same store in Toronto, then sold them to criminals. No one at the store or at the Canadian Firearms Office raised any alarm about his suspicious behaviour. Wes Winkle doesn't see straw buying as a big problem. So straw purchasing is a hot button topic and uh, you know it's it's one of those things where the, the, you know there's been some instances uh, however minuscule they are but there has been some where there's been people hired to get a firearms license and then go out and purchase firearms with that license for the criminal element. Minuscule. <laughs> I, I saw various cases where a guy goes in and buys 47 guns and, and, and the gun store owner doesn't report them and the RCMP doesn't seem to do anything about it. You know, at, at, at face value, you say that seems to be ludicrous that it's possible that that could happen. And, and uh, you know, um, for the most part, when you see that it's been happening uh, through purchases at multiple locations. I'm asking you now from the point of view of gun salespeople, Mm -hmm. uh, shouldn't that trigger a common sense alarm? You do understand though that at every type of retail store there could be as many as 25 different employees running the counter and if you're coming in at different times and different things it's it's difficult at the retail level to remember every face and every name. The, the industry was quite surprised to find out that that's not something that would have been flagged at the Canadian Firearms Registry. We kind of expected that would be the case. While police and border security put a great deal of effort and money into countering illegal weapons, the truth is that as long as there is a market, the guns will keep crossing the U.S.-Canada border. A greater challenge is to address the demand from Canadian buyers. Terence McKenna, CBC News, Windsor.